it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to follow uh, Jonathan Sabat and his uh, very informative lecture on the importance of genetics in autism. The other aspect of autism that's fundamental is the developmental neurobiology that underlies the disorder. What is the neural foundation for the very unusual social language, emotion, and cognitive abnormalities that are so prominent in this disorder that have brought all of you here? Now, I want to thank supporters of our research at NIH, Simons Foundation, NFAR, the Peter Inch Family Foundation, Autism Speaks, and the Brain Banks at NICHD and the ATP, as well as Karen Pierce and Taryn and Sierra. So much of the history of autism has been a history of searching for the, the foundational neural defects that lead to these um, behavioral deficits. So what have people found? To begin with, more than 40 or 50 studies have looked at adults and adolescents with autism. And this is the bulk of research that's been done looking at the underlying neural, molecular, and genetic features of the disorder. And what largely has been found is evidence of neuron loss and reduced size. So decreased sizes of a number of different structures, the amygdala, which is involved in emotion processing and memory, fusiform involved in faces, uh, Purkinje neuron in the cerebellum, a structure involved in a, a wide variety of motor and non-motor functions, reductions in the size of neurons, dendritic arbors, and many columns. A story of loss and reduction, thinning of cortex, thinning of the corpus callosum, and activation of pro-apoptotic molecules. Those are molecules that favor the loss of cells. So the picture of the older autistic brain is one of loss and reduced size. Is that what's underlying autism? Is that how the disorder gets started? Well, we all know that adulthood is not when autism begins. As Jonathan pointed out, autism begins in the first two years of life where in the first 12 to 24 months, a variety of red flags occur, including reduced social interest where there's a lack of warm, joyful emotional expression or responding to name or sharing emotional enjoyment or showing uh, empathy and interaction. So there's a lack of these capabilities. And there's also abnormal language development. So what's the origin? What's the developmental origin of this? Well, about 11 years ago, we looked at brain growth trajectories in autism. We began with early life. And we discovered something very surprising. The size of the brain shown over here by age at two, three, and four years of age is larger in autism as compared to controls. So there's actually not loss or reduction, but early on, autism begins with overgrowth in many individuals with autism. But you can see there's a rest of growth, and eventually it looks like there's a decline. So autism is a lifespan disorder that doesn't remain constant in its neuroanatomical basis. When we looked at our data, 80% of our individuals, two and three and four-year-olds, had brain sizes that were greater than normal average the white line being normal mean average for age. This is a child with macroencephaly whose brain volume is about 50% bigger than anybody in this room, a three-year-old boy, as compared to a normal average kid. This finding has been repeated by a number of other groups as well. And in fact, if we look at autopsy data and we look at the percent difference from the normal average weight adjusted for age, we find that autism in two to 16-year-old males, 80% have brain weights that are greater than normal average. A small number have smaller brain weights. So it's not as though all autistic individuals have enlargement, some don't. It's also not as if all autism is macroencephaly. In fact, it appears that there's been a shift upward in the, in the distribution of brain size with about a 10% overall increase on average. So whether it's looking at MRI or looking at brain weight, autism shows the shift upwards in size in many individuals. But that's not true for all individuals with autism. This is the normal control brain size. This is group average brain size for autism across 12 months to 48 months. And this is a genetic uh, defect, a deletion of a synapse gene. In this autistic individual, the brain is not enlarged, but in fact, this uh, synaptic deletion leads to a smaller brain size. Nonetheless, when we look across all studies that have been published to date that have statistically compared the size of the brain in autism to the size of the brain in controls, this is what's found. If we order studies according to the youngest uh, ages to studies of the oldest ages, we find that studies that looked at younger individuals tended to find significantly increased brain size in autism as compared to controls. The black 
are studies that found no difference. They tend to be out here, and studies that found a reduced size in autism tend to be adolescents and adults. So there appears to be a change in overgrowth, arrestive growth, and eventual decline. So what might be the cause of excessive size of the brain in autism? This seems like a very robust phenotype that we should be looking into. We decided that we would look at prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is important for higher order social, emotion, language, and communication functions. And we reasoned that one good possibility is that maybe prefrontal cortex, which is enlarged in autism, and which is important in these higher order functions that are aberrant in autism, it might be that enlargement could be due to an excess number of neurons. So we systematically counted the number of neurons throughout the entirety of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as well as mesial prefrontal cortex. What we discovered in a small sample of autistic young males as compared to young control males was that in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex there was a tremendous 79% increase in the total number of neurons as compared to the control brain. In mesial prefrontal cortex, a huge 29% more neurons than is found in controls. Now, why is this especially exciting? And the answer is, all the brain cells that you have in your prefrontal cortex, you've had since the second trimester. There is no mechanism for generating an excess of brain cells in postnatal life. So this is the first robust signature that autism begins with disarrangement of mechanisms that regulate or govern the total number of neurons that, you will, that, uh, that the child will have for the rest of their life. So let's go back to just sort of basic normal development. In prenatal life, the number of neurons increases rapidly and reaches a peak in, at the end of the second trimester where there's up to 40 billion neurons in the human brain. And this uh, time of proliferation is really remarkable because after, at the end of the second trimester, there's a period of loss of neuron numbers, or apoptosis, in which the number of neurons is halved. You go from roughly more than 40 billion neurons to roughly by birth about 20 billion neurons. So clearly, in autism, and after that you retain pretty much the same number of neurons for the rest of your life <clears throat> in prefrontal cortex. So in autism, it's possible that the excess number of neurons could be due to either a, a profound excess in the proliferative um, uh, mechanisms leading to not just a, an excess number as you see in normals, but an excess beyond that excess. Or it could be that in autism, there's a normal number generated, but there's a failure to get rid of the, uh, the extra neurons that are generated in the second trimester during this third late trimester stage of apoptosis. And it's possible that some autistic individuals may have autism for one, others for the other reason, or there may be a combined reason. We have data that we, uh, I'm not going to show you that suggests that there's a continuing loss of neuron numbers in autism. Now, this is especially interesting uh, for the purposes of the present uh, symposium. Where does all this excess likely come from? Well, as I said, two possibilities. One is mechanisms that generate and other mechanisms that eliminate. In the mouse, the prenatal brain has these zones, the ventricular zone and the subventricular zone, that are important for generating the brain cells that the mouse ends up having. Of course, the mouse's brain is very small, and if you unfolded a little sheet of cortex in the mouse, it's very tiny. The thickness of the mouse, mouse's uh, brain is about the same as yours and mine. It's about 1.8 millimeters versus ours, about three millimeters. The reason we all have a big brain is because we have a huge sheet of cortex. If you unfolded the cortex underneath your skull, it would be a large sheet, not a small little sheet like the mouse. And the reason it's gigantic is because in humans, there's been an evolutionary shift to the production of an outer subventricular zone. This unique and large primate-based zone is really, truly gigantic. The reason our brains are large and the way we produce 40 billion neurons in a really short time in just a matter of eight or 12 weeks is because of this zone. So if there's dysregulation of the process of generating cells and producing more cells, it could be that it's in this unique zone that a failure is taking place leading to an overproductivity of cells in autism.
But in the third trimester, and this is a fetal brain, and this is the brain inside the fetal brain, and if we were to section that fetal brain and look inside, we would see in the, uh, at the end of the second trimester and then on into the third trimester, we would see this. We would see, looking at cross-section, we'd see in green, stylized color, is the cortex that you and I currently have. It would be very thin and undeveloped. Cells would be very small, not very many axons. And there'd be roughly 20 billion of these from the back of the head to the front. So frontal areas and posterior areas. But look at this yellow zone. Well, this yellow zone is also about 20 billion neurons strong. And what you can see is not only is it gigantic, but as the weeks go by, it begins to disappear. And eventually, by the end of the third trimester, much of it has disappeared. And what's really interesting here, then, is that this zone, which has as many neurons as the ones that we're going to keep, the cortex, the six-layer cortex, this zone only lasts a few months. So why go to all the trouble of creating such a gigantic structure for just a few months? And the answer is that it's believed that this zone is essential for laying out the initial pattern of neural numbers, neural connectivity, and synaptic patterns throughout the cerebrum, both uh, short distance and long distance. This is the first blueprint that enables long distance connectivity between cortical structures and between uh, subcortical thalamic structures in cortex to take place. Now, what's interesting about this zone, it's called the subplate. In the mouse, the subplate is a single monolayer. That is just a single a layer of just single cells. It's very small and very rudimentary. But in humans, it has become enormous and is essential for developing all the normal human circuitry that we are familiar with that leads to higher order social, emotional, language, and cognitive functions. Notice what happens. The part of the subplate that disappears first is posterior. This part back here, the part that's involved in visual spatial information processing. The part of the subplate that's last to disappear is this part up here. That part is responsible for developing uh, the initial circuitry that's part of social, emotional, cognitive, and language functions. The frontal part, and that's the part, this is the part of the brain where we found a 67% excess of neurons globally. 79% here, 29% there. So it's possible that this very unusual, specific um, evolutionary invention uh, fails to do its job, maybe fails to disappear. Maybe the reason it fails to disappear is because it's actually not maturing and developing normal circuitry. So the signals to remove it aren't taking place. We don't know yet. It could be either genesis or apoptosis. So does excess neurons explain uh, autism and the size of the brain? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. If we look at the number of neurons in frontal cortex and we compare it to the overall size of the brain and we look at normal boys, we find if there's not very many, if there's fewer frontal neurons, there's smaller brain weight. If there's more frontal neurons, there's greater brain weight. If there's a lot more frontal neurons, then the brain is much larger. But look at autism. These people out here have twice as many brain cells as these normal individuals. These individuals with autism have twice as many brain cells, and yet they don't have the predicted size of overall brain size. For that number of neurons, their brain ought to differ by this much up here, but it doesn't. So why is that? The answer is very simple. It turns out that there is not a uniform increase of neuron numbers in autism across the brain. There's a non-uniform uh, change in neuron numbers in autism. In green, these areas of frontal cortex show a huge increase in neuron numbers. But if we look at these posterior regions of cortex that handle visual spatial information, they actually show fewer brain cells. So there is a non-uniform pattern of neuron numbers. It appears that autism involves an abnormal patterning of the number of neurons. And this is based on a, not only our studies, but the studies of other individuals. So autism is a very complex disorder in which there's a disruption of the normal circuitry, the normal number of neurons, and the normal connectivity cortex-wide. 
not shown here, and uh, somehow I left the slide out, is the fact that all of these different studies, several different groups independently, all looking at the young autistic brain, all find whether you're looking here or looking at brain cells here, that they're all smaller. There's a reduction in the size of neurons or brain cells in autism across the cortex and across individuals who've examined uh, the autistic brain. That suggests a failure of the normal growth and development of the structure. So not only is there a disruption of the pattern, but there's a failure of the full maturation of brain cells and brain circuitry. Is this found only in postmortem data? Well, this is data from looking at MRI using a measure called gray matter. So gray matter is the number of brain cells. What we found, and others have found, is that the amount of gray matter in frontal cortex is greater across all these different studies than is the case occipitally. So there's a gradient of pathology in autism with greater deviation frontally, which we think is due to excess neurons, than there is posteriorly. So what might this be due to? So if we look at frozen tissue from dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, what we found are genes that are abnormally expressed in young autistic males. What do those gene genes do? Those genes are involved in the regulation of the number of cells and their functional integrity. We found genes that are involved in these genetic uh, processes that control the cell production, the number of cells produced, that control detection of DNA uh, replication, and making sure that if there is defective replication of, of DNA and there's damage, that it's either corrected or the cell dies. But we found that genes that regulate DNA damage detection and, and repair are turned down. We found that genes involved in apoptosis, that is the getting rid of uh, excess neurons, is turned down. The same with cell differentiation, we've also found signs of immune. We also found that genes in prefrontal cortex that are involved in neural patterning, that is organizing the right-left asymmetry, for instance, for language, or the anterior-posterior asymmetry with more frontal and fewer posterior, that these patterning genes are also turned down. There's a host of those. So apparently, there's a number of different common pathways, genetic pathways, that are disrupted in this disorder. And lastly, if we take a look at not just the youngest autistic cases that I showed you from that last slide, but if we look at individuals across all ages with autism, young, adolescents, and old, and we ask what are the common denominators across all ages, and we look at the genes that are abnormally active in prefrontal cortex, we find genes that are abnormally active enriching maps or genetic pathway maps that govern the number of neurons. These genes are involved in getting rid of excess or checking for DNA damage or producing cells. We also found uh, cell differentiation genes that are dysregulated. Cell differentiation means let's grow, let's mature, let's become a full-blown uh, mature neuron. We found those dysregulated across. And then finally, immune systems. So autism is a really complex disorder involving disruption of second and trimester processes that establish the foundation of the brain, the number of brain cells, and its pattern of connection. This accounts for why the brain is enlarged, but it also accounts for how it is that there are mismatches in function between posterior regions and anterior regions. Posterior regions that are involved in visual information processing and anterior regions that are involved in more social and communication and language processing. It also points us to the beginnings of this disorder. It's not a, a, a disorder that begins at one year of age or two years of age. It's a disorder that's getting underway in the second trimester and the third trimester. So um, the foundations of trying to understand Dan's questions and addressing them as well as Pascal's questions at the beginning of this symposium really are set by considering this is what the brain is that's leading to the behavior that we'll discuss in the next lectures. So thanks very much.